Okay. Right. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. Lord, we, we thank you that um, you lead us, you enable us, you empower us. Father God, we thank you that you continue to speak to us, Lord, in uh, whatever season of life we are in. We thank you that you release your good word to us, Lord, your word that makes a difference and change, uh, brings refreshing. Father God, equips us, strengthens us. We thank you for your word, Lord. I pray that, uh, yes, Lord, let your word, Lord, produce, um, as the word of God says, about 30, 60, and 100-fold, Lord, in our lives. And may we be careful to, Lord, uh, retain it, receive it, believe in it, Lord, and uh, not let go of it, Father God, even though, Lord, sometimes the circumstances might be harsh and situations might be difficult and Lord we pray that we will learn to value your word uh, knowing from it that it's you who has spoken and released it and so God uh, yeah maybe go grow deeper or uh, in your word Lord we thank you for this time Lord we we commit ourselves into your mighty hands in Jesus matchless name we pray amen amen um, just one second. Um, okay, so um, yeah, let's. Um, I'll just share the screen and we'll just move right ahead. So we are today. We are looking at some of the practical aspects, practical instructions of um, of ministering God's word. Right. So. Yeah, so um, we are looking at some of those, um, some of the things, some of the truths that we uh, studied earlier. Also, it's a kind of an overlap of that. Um, so one of the first few things that we saw was that, you know, when we studied the Word of God and how uh, Word of God brings fruit and, and so on, we see that the Lord is watching over His Word and He wants to perform it or confirm it. Um, that's what we see in Jeremiah one twelve that the Lord is watching over His word in order to perform it. So, um, so that those are some things that uh, that really encourage us that He is going to do it. He is going to confirm it, and we are there to deliver it. We are there to uh, share and minister. Right. So we 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 need to deliver the word uh, in the best way possible, in the way that uh, we know. And taking into consideration um, that we do the word and then we teach the word, right? So we live it ourselves and then we teach it, and with the assurance and faith that God will confirm it, right? God will confirm the word that is that we share, right? Now, even though we don't see immediate results, like we can be assured that this word that has been ministered, that is shared, uh, sown in people's heart. And yes, just like how there is a season of sowing and watering and reaping, and Paul also talks about that. So Paul says that, yes, um, you know, I sowed and Apollos watered, but God is the one who gives the increase. So similarly, we see that all this is a process. It takes time and, uh, well, it need not take much time. It depends on people's um, response to the word that is being sown, you know, whether it's mixed with faith or not, right? Whether it's received, welcomed, and applied or not, right? Because we so we we see that. So that is um, that is something. But the fact is that it is a seed, right? God's word is a seed, and when it's sown. When it's in the right environment, it is going to bear fruit, and it's received in faith. So, um, so God is watching over His word, and He will perform it. Right? It, uh, at the same time, we know that you know it's not something that is automatic, but it involves the will of the person who's receiving the word. Okay. Now, the other thing that we see is that uh, a word of caution for us. You know, as ministers, is that that we don't minister the word in order to entertain people. You know, there is this aspect of your personality coming through. You know, when you minister the word, and that's fine. 
because God's word is eternal, but uh, you know, in in the or on the lips of an, a finite being, it is still God's word, right? So we see Jeremiah's case. The Lord says to Jeremiah, you know, "Open your mouth, and I will fill your mouth with, with uh, I will fill my uh, with, with my, your mouth with my word, and then this is what you will you are going to do." Uh, you will establish, you will tear down, and, and so on. So the ministry of this eternal word from this infinite God through, released through a finite man, a finite person like Joshua, like you and I, you know, is still God's word, is still powerful, and uh, will still uh, release the purpose for which it has been released, right? It will cost. Therefore, you know, considering all this, don't uh, treat it as mere entertainment, right? Now, the, since it's coming through human personality, it will have traces of that, right? Maybe a person is having a very intellectual bent of mind, right? Is very academic. Well, it will come through. Maybe a person is uh, very serious, and right? it will come through. It will come through. The personality will come through in the delivery of the word. Maybe a person is humorous. Right? That will come through in the delivery in the minister of ministering of the word. Right. So that's that is fine. Right? But let the intention be never to entertain with the word of God. Now, well, we do have certain you know Christian um, people in Christian entertainment. Right. So. Um, You've heard. Uh, I, I remember there was one one pastor, you know, and uh, he was in Christian stand-up comedy, right? But um, so that is different, right? He was, he was not there to minister the word. But he was there to uh, be in that entertainment place or mountain of entertainment to be a voice of truth, to be a you know to be a person who can say, okay, hey, this entertainment can be clean. You know, this whole thing of stand-up comedy can be clean, and um, it it need not have immorality in it. Uh, the word of God says, "Let there not be a hint of immorality among you." Right. So, so he he did that uh, for some time. Right? The stand-up comedy, clean and uh, wholesome comedy that a, a family can actually sit and listen and and not be embarrassed. You know, so so something like that. Right? So we're not talking about that, but we're talking about using the, you know, the pulpit or, uh, you know, the the church uh, or the or, you know, as the congregation and using that time to entertain. Right. So never do that because the word of God can bring about and uh, word of God is all that uh, He said He is, and God is who He said He is. And therefore, he wants to confirm the ministry of the word. So therefore, just minister the word, right? So, yeah. Then, um, our task is to deliver the unadulterated word of God in all sincerity. So, so that is how we minister. Um, like Paul says in, uh, let me just share that verse, Second Corinthians 2 and verse 17, right? It's, uh, I'll just put it in the chat as well, and I can read it. It says, uh, for we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Okay, so, so there was a situation in the, in the church of those days, when I say church, you know, several other churches and um, the churches of those times, and he's typically talking about uh, Corinth and Ephesus and, and, uh, and that region, right? He's saying we're not so as so many peddling the word of God. So people were actually what is what does peddling mean? Peddling means you alter something, you change it for your benefit, right? So you're you're altering it, you're compromising it, you're um, adding something to it or taking away something to it from it. Um, so in order to you know get a favorable response from the audience. So so Paul says no. We are not peddling the word of God, but we speak the word of God as out of sincerity, right? Um, in a, another scripture, uh, let me share that as well. 
second Corinthians four. Again, verses one to two. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. By, by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So what is the meaning of this? Right. So he's saying, you know, we have this ministry. And in fact, um, prior to this, he's talking about how uh, we have, God has made um, him and the team there as ministers of the new covenant. Right. So he's contrasting the old covenant and the new covenant and so on. And, and uh, he's, he's talking about how uh, you guys are an epistle you know, written by the Holy Spirit and not with ink and by the Holy Spirit written on tablets of you know, uh, flesh of the heart and so on. So, so he's saying, you know, therefore, we have this kind of ministry, which is a glorious ministry. It's a New Testament ministry, which is, you know, which is uh, which is far greater than the old covenant and. Uh, of the law which brought about death so it's of the spirit which brings life so we have this ministry so he says we do not lose heart we are not discouraged we are not uh, and we don't lose hope um, but we, as we have renounced the hidden things of shame not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of god deceitfully okay so craftiness means to um, this human cunning uh, ness, cunningness in human cunning behavior, maybe deceitfully, maybe um, even it can be, uh, you know, manipulating. So he's saying we are not walking like this. We are not living like this, right? And we're not ministering like this. So he's saying not handling the word of God deceitfully. So handling the word of God meaning, you know, uh, ministering from the word. We don't do it deceitfully in order to get something for us, get a benefit for us. Uh, um, from the people, you know, we don't do that. So that is something we need to keep in mind as well. So we need to make sure that we deliver the uncompromised word, right? as far as possible. What is it that you've done your best in preparing and in, in uh, uh, you know in studying and, and and putting to practice? You share it, right? Uh, another scripture that we can look at, First Thessalonians two, and verses three to six. First Thessalonians chapter two, verses three to six. Okay, so it says here. Uh, oops. Uh, yeah, First Thessalonians chapter two. For our exhortation, okay, did not come from error or uncleanness nor was it in deceit but as we have been approved by god to be entrusted with the gospel even so we speak not as pleasing men but god who tests our hearts for neither at any time did we use flattering words but as you know uh, as you know for a cloak for covetousness god is witness nor did we seek glory from men either from you or from others, and we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. So um, see, he's just revealing, he's just sharing about the kind of ministry, how they ministered the word. And so we learn, you know, saying, okay, this is something that I need to have in my life. So he's saying that our exhortation, our encouragement from the word did not come from error or uncleanness. So the source of that encouragement was a righteous source. Right? It was it did it come it came from truth. In other words, it did not come from error. It came from truth. It did not come from uncleanness, but it came from righteousness. Right? And then he says, nor was it in deceit or deception or lies. Right. But as we have been approved by God, so in being born again and in being entrusted with this ministry, as we have been approved by God um, to be entrusted with the gospel. Even so, we speak. Okay, so as we've been approved by God and, and entrusted by God with the gospel, even so, we speak. Look at the second part of it. He said, "Not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts." So when you know when we speak out of error 
or uncleanness or you know even in deceit it means that we speak to please the people to please the hearer okay uh, and but we, we we compromise on pleasing god who knows our hearts so which means that in the ministering you know there's a hid, hidden agenda right there's a hidden agenda and uh, so you're not being entirely truthful you're not being entirely sincere because you want to please the person so you hold back from sharing certain things hold back you know it could be maybe the harshness of you know harshness of the ministry you hold back because you don't want the person to not you know not get into ministry maybe whatever just an example right so it could be also that um, you withhold um, hold back information about the reality of a christian walk or the reality of the life of a believer where paul says that all those who desire to live godly in christ jesus will suffer persecution you know there'll be some form of persecution it could be uh, it could be some ridiculing and making fun of and uh, or it could be you know on the other side you know on the other end of that same thing it could be uh, maybe physical harm and danger and even martyrdom right so so paul is saying hey, all those who desire to live for god in some form of the other there will be some resistance there will be some opposition there will be persecution right so now he shared that very openly with the church right so even so we need to we need to be you know and not be afraid of speaking the truth in love so because we are we want to be god please us and not just pleasers of men okay for it says neither at any time did we use flattering words so we didn't use words to flatter you what does flatter you mean you know, being insincere to make someone feel good or you know feel um you know feel better but being insincere right the outcome is okay you're just um, the person feels happy the person feels um, hey, uh, you know, I'm so and so. You're just elevating the person, uh, insincerely elevating the person. So he's saying you are using flattery words. It is a cloak, which means it is a cover. Okay, so you're using the flattery words and fla words that flatter and saying nice things about the person, but it's actually a cover, meaning it is it is like a screensaver. You know, it's not the real screen, right? And you know, you, you tap the keys and. And then you or move the mouse and then you see the actual screen it's like a screen saver so it's like a cover for what for covetousness right so it's like a it's like a facade that you put but what is behind that cover what is behind that flattery covetousness what is covetousness you actually desire what that person has and you want to have it not in a rightful ma manner but in an unrighteous manner right so maybe other person's belongings other person's you know material wealth whatever it is that is covetousness right so it is a cover for covetousness it is a cover it's a it's a uh, it's something that a cloak you use a cloak a piece of clothing in order to cover something so it's used as a cloak for covetousness and then she says you know we did not see glory from men neither from you or from others uh, when we might have made demands as apostles of god no, no. the lord says that those who um serve the gospel must live by so you know minister the gospel must live by the gospel and so on so he said hey, though though we might have made demands as apostles we did not so something for us to you know bear in mind that our task is to deliver the word of god uh, do not adulterate it in any way. Do not compromise the content of it in any way, whether by withholding, whether by adding, uh, whether to please people or to had to to you know to indulge in human human cunningness. In all these ways, we avoid so that we can deliver the word of God in an unadulterated manner. Um, the second thing, uh, the other thing that we see is um, Paul's letter 
uh, I mean Paul's instruction to Timothy, right? Second Timothy chapter two, and he says, "You need to rightly divide the word of God." So, what does that mean? Rightly, divide. let's look at that verse. Second Timothy chapter two. And verse 15, right? Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. It says, um, um, he, he gives a lot of instructions to Timothy, who's a pastor there in the church at Ephesus. Um, so he says, you know, remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words, to no profit, uh, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. So he says, be diligent, which means give every effort, honest effort, to present yourself approved unto God, right? To present yourself to uh, God, uh, approved by God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed. Okay, so, so which means you're being very sincere, you're being very open, transparent, that you're not hiding anything. Um, you're not willingly intentionally walking in sin so so, um, so that you don't have to be ashamed of any of these things right but he's saying that you rightly divide the word of you do all this and rightly divide the word of god so um, that word there uh, second, second timothy 2 verse 15 conveys the uh, conveys the meaning of rightly interpreting right um let's uh, i just See what uh, just pull out what word is used there. Um, two and verse fifteen. Okay, um, rightly dividing. Right? So it is to cut straight and to cut in a way that uh, that is straight. You know, you know, which is equivalent, which is uh, doing it right, um, and to it literally means to make a straight cut. To make a straight cut or a dissection, to make a straight cut. So, so he is he's saying that you know rightly divide the word of God. Okay, don't go. Uh, and so it it carries this whole idea of studying the word, interpret the word rightly, so that you can believe right, you can teach right, and others who believe also will be able to live right. Right. So rightly divide the Word of God. Okay. So which means that your interpretation cannot be subjective, cannot be biased. Uh, it has to go with the rest of scripture. Okay. Avoid arguments over words. So um, avoid these things. Don't just be contentious and avoid and um, uh, you know don't, don't don't be indulging in these things, right? So we're looking at Second uh, Timothy chapter. 2 and verse 14, the same chapter, verse 14, uh, not to strive over words. So he's saying, you know, strive is to have some contentions, to quarrel. So he's saying, uh, tell them not to strive over words. Okay, so issues that, um, that are not really, you know, the fundamental or the core, you know, don't just get into these arguments over words. Right. Just uh, let go. It's fine. Okay. To avoid these arguments over words. Um, then compare your understanding with what other established teachers have said. And uh, you know, so when it comes to rightly dividing the word of God and uh, and all that, so it's it's important for us to consider uh, what are what are all the all the other established teachers said. You know, am I in total departure of what they are saying? Right, and what I'm sharing is it very different from what I'm saying? Right? Why? Just consider that. You know, it's a guardrail. It's something that really protects us. It's like a boundary. Right? It protects us. It's good. Be humble enough to consider. Right? Now, well, they could, they could be wrong and sincerely wrong, but then it's good for us to consider that viewpoint and study, uh, look at what they're saying. Right? Compare. Uh, our understanding with that. Okay. Um, Second Peter chapter one and verse twelve says, "Minister the present truth." Okay. 
So I want to ask you this. What is the present truth? Are there different categories of truth? Uh, what is the present truth? Second Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Okay, for this reason, I will not be I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Right? So what do you think? What is it? what is Paul talking about? Established in the present truth. Anyone? You can put it in the chat as well. Okay. Present truth. What is it? What is he referring to? Right. So let me just read that verse again. For this this reason I will not be negligent. So he's saying, you know, I'm not going to be I'm not going to neglect this, right? Um uh, but I'm going to always remind you of these things, whatever he has written prior to this, and even in the first episode. So he's saying, I'm going to um, always uh, remind you of, always of these things. Though you know and are established in the present truth. So what does that mean? Does truth have uh, you know, time limit to it? And what is it? What do you think? Present truth. Anyone? Present truth. Yeah. Yes, yeah. sir. Whatever you are speaking now. Yeah. I mean, the word of God you are speaking now in the present time according to the New Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, what we are speaking now, according to the New Testament, Diksha says to live according to God's word, about the gospel, timely word, okay, uh, present dispensation. Yeah, so that's the that's the thing, you know. Um, well, the word of God, you know, to live according to God's word, etc., uh, about the gospel and a timely word, and now word is is all, you know, it's it's all part of our ministering. But to minister the present truth is, is to minister in the dispensation, to present it in the dispensation, which means, um, you know, it just means that, um, that we, what is the dispensation? What is the covenant that uh, we are living in? Be mindful of that. You know? um, I'll just share the... Uh, it, it's something that when you say dispensation, right, it's a, it's a, a system at a particular time. Okay, so, what belief system is there at this particular time? You know, are we in the what is the present dispensation, or um, what is the dispensation that we are living in? Right. Obviously, we are living in a dispensation where the cross is a finished work. Right? We are not living in the dispensation where we are looking towards the cross, right? where the cross is going to be a future event and we are looking forward to it. No, we are in a dispensation where we look back at what has already happened. So when we consider the cross, it is already done, already finished. Right? We are in that dispensation. So he's saying, you know, you, I know you are established in the present truth, so you know what it is. Uh, there are several examples, right? For for example, if you look at um, Paul goes to Ephesus. Okay, we read about it in I think in Acts chapter nineteen, right? He goes to Ephesus. Um, he meets some believers there. Um, let me just make sure that it's nineteen. Yeah. So um, Ephesians, uh, uh, sorry, Acts chapter nineteen. So he meets certain believers there. Now they seem to be in a time warp. <laughs> You know, so because he goes there, and they and then they are believers. So it says here, uh, verse one, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth, and that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples there, he said to them, 
right so these are disciples already you know um, uh, they believe in jesus so he finds some disciples and he asks them did you receive the holy spirit verse 2 did you receive the holy spirit when you believed so they said to him we have not so much as heard whether there is a holy spirit you know a very very different response a di response that makes you wonder wow what is happening here right these are, are aren't they disciples yes they are do they love the lord follow the lord yes it says disciples of the lord right so which means they follow jesus but they don't have an understanding of the holy spirit so he says you know they say that we, we have not heard of the holy spirit then he asks them he presses them he presses and in and asks them another question he says so into what were you baptized what kind of baptism did you have they said, so they say a baptism of repentance like what john did and then he gets them baptized in the name of the in the name of the lord jesus and they are also filled with the holy spirit so all these other experiences which is the present truth which is there available for the believer who's living on this side of the cross right what all are available hey, our identity in christ our inheritance in christ jesus the authority that we have in christ jesus our position in christ jesus right the finished work of the lord uh, a finished work of healing deliverance and the curse is being taken and it's a finished work he declared it is done it is finished you know it's like a legal verdict he's he's declared that and the indwelling presence of the holy spirit and the fact that the holy spirit you know fills us so that we can be witnesses with power okay and the holy spirit releases the gifts of the spirit so that with that we can be witnesses with power so all this is available for the believer and that is what is the the present truth right so he's saying we need to minister the present truth right? we need to first of all we need to have a revelation we need to have the understanding of it right um, acknowledge it be assured of it and minister the present truth let people um, you know when you're ministering let people be exposed to what is available for them exposed to what god wants for them and all that is you know possible uh, you know if, if you look at um, romans chapter 8 or yeah so romans 8 i think it's uh, 32 now he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him also freely give us all things right? there are so many that we have received uh, freely by grace through faith right and then 1 corinthians chapter 2 uh, verse 9 as it is written i has not seen nor you have heard nor have entered in, entered into the heart of man the things which god has prepared for those who love him but god has revealed them to us through his spirit for the spirit searches all things yes the deep things of god so there is this revelation that the holy spirit is bringing about and and this is a truth so you we can't live in uh, an isolated time period right we have to receive what god is doing here and now we have to be aware of the restorative moves of god we have to be aware of where god is you know leading um, the fivefold ministry and the you know, equipping of the saints for the work of ministry and uh, where we have this understanding there's no you know the clergy and laity and and that kind of thing but then those who are called you know, it could be anyone who are called those who are called can you know step into that place or ministry office and those who are called you know and you step in and then get trained and commissioned and um yes and then you serve so so all this uh, we get to minister right so um so that's something so uh minister the present too okay um any questions here
or any thoughts, anything that you want to share. Okay. Okay, so um, the next thing that we want to see is that, um, just one second. Yeah, so you, you don't always have to have a brand new revelation that the world has never heard before, right? Yeah, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of revelation, is the spirit of wisdom. Okay, no doubt about it, right? So he when he shares, when he ministers, he, he gives us, he throws a light, he reveals those things which are hidden, hidden to be found. Right, mysteries which are hidden things to be discovered. So he he reveals those things. Right? Matthew chapter thirteen, verse fifty-two. Okay, uh, it says that therefore every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Okay, so things new. And old, um, so the revelation could be something that is something that is new, but also something that is old. So um, every scribe is talking about those who are, you know, uh, the scribes of those days. They they are instructed. They were instructed or trained concerning the kingdom of heaven. It's like a person who brings from the household old and new. So it's it's both what has already been established. You share that, you don't have to be under undue pressure or expectation that oh, I used to I need to have something absolutely brand new to minister to in order to minister to the people. Right? Uh, we don't have to. We don't have to be under such pressure, and we don't have to do that. Right? Okay. Let's look at another scripture, which is just one second. Um. Yeah. Okay, so we're looking at uh, John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 31. Okay. Because then Jesus said to the Jews who believed, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free or make you free. Okay. So, the Lord is saying, you know, my word leads you to truth. You, I mean, you will know the truth. But how will you know the truth if you stay, if you abide in my word? And if you stay, if you abide, if you continue, if you continue on with the word of God. So it means continue hearing, continue doing, uh, and all that. So you continue in it. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So, um, well, what has the Lord spoken already? You abide in it. You stay in it. You continue in it. Right. So, so as we do that, He leads us into all truth, and truth sets us free. Okay. Uh, Hebrews two one also, you know, talks about something similar, and. Um, just a minute. Okay, let's look at um, yeah Hebrews two and verse one. Okay, so it says, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Now this is a no, it's a it's a very important verse. And it's uh, something that we need to take seriously because it it cautions us. It 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 reminds us of the fact that hey, there is a possibility of drifting. Okay, now this drifting is dangerous because it doesn't happen overnight. Okay? Drifting happens over a period of time. It the 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 distance that you drift away could be very minimal so that we don't even notice that we are you know it's like a boat that is drifting away from the shore right it's not anchored to the shore it's not tied tethered to the to the harbor whatever so it's 
it's slowly drifting. So now the distance it drifts away at a particular moment may not be much. Right? The waves are there, it's just bobbing up and down and it is there. But then suddenly you realize that, oh, hey, the distance from the shore, I've really come a long way off from the shore, a long way. And then you realize that it's, you know, that's a reality, right? So it's a it's a dangerous position. So here, what is the writer of Hebrews saying? He's talking about the fact that one is drift, drifting away or moving away from what they knew to be true. Right? They were established in truth, but they've slowly moved away. So he's saying, you know, lest we drift away. Now, what is the antidote for it? What is the solution? How do we prevent that? Saying we must give more earnest heed to the things that we have heard. Okay, so again, when it comes to a revelation, it's the truth that has already been spoken. It's the truth that you already know. It's the truth that you're established in. Give earnest heed to it. Okay. So the importance of even reiterating um, a truth which has already been spoken, reiterated, remind people about it. And it's a reminder, timely reminder, uh, and lest they drift away. So you're making sure that hey, we need to give earnest heed to this. We have heard it before, but we need to, you know, be careful or give focus, give attention to it. Uh, otherwise, we'll drift away. Drift away from this revelation, from this truth. You know, it could be about who we are in Christ Jesus. It could be about how we are seated within in the heavenly places, the authority that he has given us. Right? It could be about all that. You know, it could be about the purpose that we have. So many things. We can drift away from it if we are not constantly being careful about it. The enemy comes to steal. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Mark chapter 4, the enemy comes to take the word because the word can produce. The word produces. Uh, a word brings fruit, and the enemy comes to steal. Right, so, so the importance of reiterating what is already being spoken, the importance of giving earnest heed, to be careful, to to uh, to ensure that it is kept, protected, right, in our lives, um, so that it, we don't drift. Right, so that needs to be ministered as well. Okay, so that is the aspect that we are looking at. Right, some practical aspects of ministering the word, sharing the word, communicating it. Now that needs to be done when we are ministry okay um okay um, avoid subjective revolution uh, revelations um meaning that um, uh, just uh, let's just look at that word second timothy first timothy chapter four so something that is subjective something that is of uh, personal bias um for verse one or two right so it says now the spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot, seared with a hot iron. Right? So saying, okay, and now if there is a subjective revelation, revelation subjective meaning it is, it is not objective. Right? So what is the difference? Well, objective is without bias, without, um, without any prejudice, and without um, it is in context, right? It is not out of context. You don't take something out of context. So we avoid those kinds of revelations or conclusions about certain things in the Bible, right? So subjective revolution, revelations, sorry, always lead to, you know, um, well. Now, the dangerous thing is that it could it could lead to heresy, it could lead to uh, maybe a cultic tendency, and so on. Right? So avoid that. Okay? And uh, uh, First Timothy, uh, the last chapter, verses three and five, three to five, okay? um, says, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, 
reviling evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain, from such withdraw yourself. Yeah. So uh, it, it's again a warning. It's, a, it, it's again a caution about, you know, you see the different, this kind of ministry. Okay. They, they think that godliness is a means of gain. It's like a business for me. You know, the godliness, living a godly life or even ministry, it's a business. It's a means of gain. So it's a means of prof a means of profitability. It's an avenue of profitability. So he's saying, you know, from such, uh, you keep away. Um, so he's also talking about what, uh, you know, what is the, the kind of person uh, we're dealing with, but he also says that okay, this is what they do. They are obsessed with disputes, obsessed with disputes, and uh, and also obsessed with arguments over words, which gives rise to envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, and you know, all the negative things. And you don't want that. You don't need that, right? So um, don't indulge in that. Okay, so uh, so that is what it is. But the root of it is that that you're not consenting to wholesome words. Okay, you're not uh, listening to or receiving wholesome words. Um, did anyone uh, ask a question or put their hand up? Okay. Okay. Um, the last couple of things. Watch what you what you teach, because Paul says, you know, uh, again in verse sixteen, chapter four. Take heed to yourself. Be careful, and to the doctrine. Right. Be careful about how you live your life and what you teach. Continue in it, for in doing so you will save both yourself and the ones who hear you. Right. So, um, so he's saying this is what you might do when it comes to preaching the word, teaching the word. You be careful how you live your life, and you be careful about what you teach, because if you do this, then you will save both yourself and the others. Right. Then. Uh, the last one is to develop the ability to communicate God's word clearly. Right, so it's a skill, it's an ability that we we learn in order to share it clearly in a way that people understand. Okay, so the next section is actually about some practical steps about that and how can I speak or how can I communicate clearly? Right, how can I do so? How can I avoid, uh, you know, uh, how, how can I avoid distractions? How can I avoid confusions and so on? And then the next section also, key to effective preaching, is, is more on the practical side. This is the fun side of it. Okay, so uh, next class we will uh, look into it, right? Okay, fine. Okay, so we'll stop here. Um, thank you and God bless.